Welcome to the first event of the 2016-17, um, sorry, yeah, History and Theory of New Media Lecture Series, organized by myself and Professor David Bates, who is in the Department of Rhetoric, and um, my name is Gail DeCosnick. I'm in the Berkeley Center for New Media and the Department of Theatre, Dance, and Performance Studies. And um, tonight it's my pleasure to introduce Miriam Poster. Miriam is the Digital Humanities Program Coordinator and a member of the core DH faculty at the University of California, Los Angeles. As a digital humanist, she is particularly interested in the visualization of large bodies of data from cultural heritage institutions and the application of digital methods to the analysis of images and video. A film, media, and visual culture scholar by training, she frequently writes on the history of science and technology. She's also a member of the Executive Council of the Association for Computers and the Humanities. I met Miriam earlier this year at the Society for Cinema Studies, Cinema and Media Studies Conference in Atlanta, and I attended her talk and her short workshop on network analysis. She was amazing and fabulous, and I knew that we had to have her in the lecture series this year. So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Miriam Posner. Facebook 
uh, friendships and say, oh, this group is denser than the other one, meaning that people are more deeply connected, or this group is more sparsely connected. Um, and once you have built up enough examples, you can begin to make surmises about the nature of these different networks. Let me just pause there. Questions? <laughs> Angry interjections, <laughs> personal questions, riddle, yes. How, how have you and your research networks dealt with um, like mobility, social mobility, okay, social mobility. And, change, and change over time in mm -hmm. terms of who a hub is or central nodes? That's a really good question. Um, most of the off-the-shelf tools for network analysis are not great at handling change over time. As much as I wish they were because I often want to see that. Um, so uh, most people tend to do snapshots. So like a moment as evidence for this network compared to another moment. And then often people will string them together and put in video. Um, but it is one of the more difficult yet interesting problems. Um, is there any way to check your network analysis, or do you just like produce it and then start interpreting from it? What do you mean by check? Um, like today I generated a word cloud, and at first I thought it was completely correct, but then I realized that it was wrong and I had to fix it. But before that, I had already started interpreting it. So oh. I was wondering, is there any way of verifying your, your results? Oh, that's a really good question. And it gets into an area of statistical analysis that I have to confess is not my strength. But um, it involves generating random models and then comparing your network against these random models. So if it's useful to you, I can send um, Gail some examples of how people have done that. It's a really good question. I mean, I think these models have a way of like reifying themselves. Um, and it's a problem people are really dealing with right now. You generate a model and you're like, well, you know, like, why might that have been? Instead of saying, wait, is that right or not? Um, so it's a real problem, but I don't think we've totally solved. All right, so various reasons one might use network analysis, mostly if one is interested in relationships. Um, I wanted to give you an example of how I used network analysis by um, using the example of um, a specific community of people, and these are people who performed as actors in the films of Oscar and the show. Um, has anyone here seen it in Oscar and the show? Oh, you guys should watch them because they're really neat. Um, this is just a clip from Within Our Gates from 1920. Um, that's even clearer there. And I think that's more like Chanel, um, the male actor. Um, Oscar Michaud was what's known as a race filmmaker, meaning that he made films designed for African American audiences during the early part of the 20th century. And as I was, you know, reading about Oscar Michaud and thinking about his films, I read an article by Evelyn Greer's daughter um, discussing um, the ways in which the actors were all deeply connected to each other. Um, she talked about the fact that a lot of actors came out of the same stage theatrical companies and went on to work in Oscar Michaud's films and formed these kind of film companies. Um, so I thought, well, that's a nice little self-contained community. Perhaps I'll, I'll try building a network out of that. And this is how, this is how I did it. It's not too hard. <coughs> so the really conceptually, there's a chair here if you'd like. The really conceptually challenging part of doing, um, making a network, the first challenging part, I should say, is this problem of creating what's called an edge list, meaning creating the basic entities that are going to form the network itself. Um, and the problem that, that we were all kind of struggling with together during class today is the fact that you can only have at most really two kinds of things. You can have cheese and you can have crackers. But you can't also have cookies. Um, you can have films and you can have actors, but you can't also have producers. So you need to find a way to to, to boil all the diversity and variety in the world into just two kinds of things. And that's where networks get really tricky. And in order to build a network, you have to kind of be okay with this um, 
you know, terrible injustice that you're doing to all the, all the, the, the variety that exists in the world. I'm going to stop there just so that, so that it's clear what's happening here. So I have two things. You can, you can see how I did it. It's really simple. I just used Excel. I created one column called Films, one column called Actors. Everybody who showed up in a film got listed side by side with the film they appeared in. Um, so once I have a list like that, I can start drawing it out in a certain way. So I'll start with the film The Home Center. Well, I know from my list that certain people appeared in The Home Center. Um, and I denote that using these lines, which are called edges. So the entities that are often called nodes, and then the lines are edges. And this is simple enough. You can see that those lines show a relationship to the film. And in this case, the relationship is that they appeared in the film. Meanwhile, I also know um, that on my list is included the film within our dates. And Evelyn Creer appeared in both the home center and within our gates. So here's a way of just making it clear that she's sort of a connecting line in between these two films. So suddenly, a relationship that wasn't clear at first glance at a table becomes much more clear as a diagram. And then the software packages that you plug an edge list into, an edge list, again, is this, this spreadsheet. No more complicated than that. The software package that you plug the edge list into just does the same thing, but at a bigger scale. So here you can see all of Oscar Micheaux's films are here. All of the actors are here, too. Um, the more edges, the more lines connect into a film, the larger that node becomes. The same with an actor the larger the node becomes, the more connections it actor has. And they're different colors, green for the film, pink for the actor. <coughs> so certain things become clearer once they're documented in this way. Um, it's more clear kind of which films have a lot of different actors. It becomes more clear that Evelyn Pryor appeared in a lot of films. Um, I've never been like a natural at like, reading visualizations. It always takes me a little while to get them. Um, but and, and I think network graphs are even a little bit harder than other kinds of visualizations to grasp. But you know that's base, that's the basic principle of, of, of network graphs. Yes. So why the overall shape and why like is that will appear close to the group but not close to the entity? This is a great question. This came up um, earlier too. Um, this woman from the class today want to want to take that question. Thank you. Class and me doesn't happen at all. Thank you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we learned something. Yeah. And the other thing that stuck with me was that pretty much the software's priority is legibility mm -hmm. above all else. Yeah. Exactly right. That's exactly right. So, you know, the software uses what's called a layout algorithm to kind of <coughs> position everything on a canvas, and the priority for the layout algorithm is gonna like just be making everything fit. So even though our eyes and our cognitive processes expect proximity to indicate some kind of relationship, it actually doesn't. So I'm really glad you asked that. Because um, it seems as though having something off in the periphery would mean that it's less connected. And it, that may be true. I mean, often legibility overlaps with connection, but not always. So when you're as I told the class earlier, when you're looking at visualizations in the newspaper or online, just remember that your eyes want to see proximity as an indicator of connectivity, but in fact, it's, that's not necessarily the case. Yeah. Unless you choose a layout that is using a centrality algorithm or something like this. That's right. Yeah. So you can you can choose to, to make that the case. Most it seems that the most network graphs that you'll see use what's called a force-directed um, layout algorithm, which just means they spread things out. Um, and in that case, it, it doesn't matter. But you're right, some, some, some cases they do. Other questions? Can I just add a little I think that's one of, in fact, like the strongest arguments for using uh, networks in graphic software uh -huh. is the ability to visualize the 
exact same data set in different patterns based on, you know, you're talking about degree here, it indicates the size of the node and the size of the text. But if you, you know, create a subset of this data and then visualize it in a different way, degrees will change. You know, you'll get different node sizes that you can compare back to the original. Um, I mean, just that alone, which is really simplistic, can be very valuable in understanding the context of these films and the actor's role in, in that regard. Totally true. Yeah, there's nothing more powerful than putting your data through the paces yourself to realize that a lot of these visualizations, which have this way of seeing the authority, are really quite contingent on a lot of decisions that you can make along the way. Um, by the way, that reminds me that if, if you want to put your data through the paces yourself, um, I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but if you find yourself curious about software and tutorials, that's all stored here at pit.ly slash ucbnets. Um, the very best documentation I can find about what network analysis is and tutorials you might use is all stored there. So, um, especially if you have to leave it away, just remember that URL. Okay, so we know that we can, um, we can see something cool if we connect films and actors, um, but there are some things that are a little bit harder to see. Like, if I'm interested not really in who's in what film, but who has a relationship with whom, it's a little bit tricky in this kind of network graph, because you can sort of trace it back through these film nodes. And conversely, if you're interested in which films shared actors, it's a little bit tricky. You have to trace back through this node to see which films shared actors. And when you, when you find yourself frustrated like that, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, opportunity for some data manipulation. Um, so one thing you might want to do in network analysis is go from what's called a two-mode network, meaning two different kinds of things, to a one-mode network, which means just one kind of thing. So even though you've already brutalized the contingency and variety of the world, you have to take it one step further and boil it down even more. Um, so if this is my example, um, you'll see that this edge list here, this is pretty familiar to you probably, it's films and actors. But I'm really curious to see which films shared actors, not so much um, both sides of the coin. So I'm gonna take Evelyn Creer and use her as my connection because she, remember, appeared in both of these films. So my edge list goes from this to this, the homes that are and within our gates shared an actor. And that's their, that, that, um, that composes a dyad. Um, and we call this process of going from two modes to, to one mode or two kinds of things to one kind of thing, we call that going from projecting from a bimodal to a unimodal network. Are there questions about that, what's happening there? So now that we have a unimodal network, we can do some kind of cool things. Um, we can show, for example, that these two films showed an unusually high, or shared an unusually high number of actors. Um, and we do that by assigning weights to their connections. So if a, if a film shared 10 actors, it has a weight of 10. Well, if a film only shared one actor, it has a weight of one. And just by tweaking some little software options, we can turn up the volume on that edge to make it more apparent that these actors, or that these films shared actors. We can also, as you might have anticipated already, go the other direction and show which actors co-appeared in films. Um, and by by projecting my network in this direction, I was able to show, um, or at least suggest, that a couple of actors are, are sort of interesting to me. Um, Amy DeCompier here and Evelyn Creer both seem to have this important connection function, that they both seem to connect different communities of actors. And so, as you know, 
as a careful scholar, I'm probably not going to use this as definitive proof of anything, but it might suggest some possibilities for me that I should really look into what these actors were doing that they seem to bridge lots of communities. I could also look at who appear together uh, at least twice, and that was my that was the, the criterion I used for these red edges here. And by looking at actors this way, I surmised that the fact that there were two sort of clusters of actors who tended to appear together, one before 1927 and one after 1927, which I actually didn't know um, and doesn't really appear in the literature. But, you know, just thinking about it, I mean, 1927 is the introduction of sound film, so I wonder if that might have had something to do with the evolution of acting companies. So it suggests for me just a new direction I might take my research. Um, yeah, so, so that's, that's, that's one of the ways in which I've used network analysis in my own work. I had a lot of fun doing this, and I had so much fun just thinking about race film networks that my students and I, over the course of a quarter, assembled a race film database. So not just Oscar Micheaux's films, but all race films um, prior to 1930. And we built basically the same diagram on a much larger scale and made it you know, searchable on the web as well. So, so this is just a tool for exploring who was connected to whom. It allows you to zoom in on one actor in particular, have one career, and then to see how she's connected to other actors. It's not particularly scientific in any way, but um, but it's a it's an exploratory tool and, and allows you to kind of suggest some options. Any questions about that or how we got from one to the other? Yeah. Can you tell us a bit more about the platform you were using? Totally. Yeah. So. Um, as I'll explain a little bit later, there are various tools you can use for network analysis, everything from Google Fusion Tables to R or Python. Um, I've gotten to this point in my own work where I sort of switched back among different tools. So this particular net network graph was constructed with, I think, Gephi, and then R, and then um, a JavaScript library called D3. So there was a little bit of custom programming involved in something like this. It's still possible to create um, dynamic, interactive web-based network diagrams without custom programming. It just doesn't look exactly the way you want. All right, cool. So, yeah, please. So you asked about time, and you had 327 inactive, so did you just run your data Manually, to do two different graphs, or do you really manage time? To show pre 1927. Well, that was just something I realized after I had made the graph. So, D wasn't even a factor when I was building this graph, but when I boiled it down to these two communities and looked at them more closely, I realized that these actors appeared in films before 1927, and these appeared in films after 1927. So it wasn't an attribute of the data, although it could have been actually an attribute of the data. It just wasn't something I thought to record. So those diagrams aren't actual. I mean, you didn't have to break your data set into two. And do two different. I just um, extracted them from this diagram. So I said, uh, okay. I said, show me only those actors that have multiple edges, <laughs> that have high edge rates, basically. And these were oh, okay. what, what surface. Thank you for that. Yeah. Awesome. So, one thing that's important to know is that we love network diagrams, we love looking at them, we love splashing them on the covers of books and stuff, but their legibility kind of is very limited after a certain number of nodes. Like, once you get past, like, 100 or so, it's really hard to understand what a network diagram is showing you. And that's why, like, serious network scientists will often get rid of the the visualizations altogether in favor of some other kind of measures of networks. Like they'll measure density, 
you know, they'll compare density and chart that rather than charting the two networks um, in the typical way. So, so it's important to know that. At the same time, my experience um, with humanists and humanities and collected social scientists has been that network diagrams are very attractive as an exploratory tool rather than kind of measures in and of themselves. And so even if their legibility is, is not all that one might hope, I find that humanists like that capability to see visually how things are connected. All right, so just a little bit about terminology and then we'll, uh, we'll make you participate a little bit. Um, that whole network thing, the blob of, of nodes and edges, is called a graph. So often computer scientists will just refer to a graph. And you're like, what kind of graph? And that's what they mean. They mean a network graph. So it can be a little bit confusing. Um, as you recall, these, these circles are often called nodes or vertices. Um, and these lines are edges. Um, just some vocabulary. And these nodes and edges, or these edges can be directed or undirected. So maybe I really like IKEA, but she does not like me. In that case, my, 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 um, our relationship is not reciprocal. So I have a line going one way towards IKEA. On the other hand, if we really like each other, then it's a reciprocal relationship and undirected. So Twitter is an example of a directed network because you can follow someone and they don't have to follow you back. But Facebook is undirected because if you're friends with someone, they have to be friends with you. That's how it works. Unless you're a page. Anyway. <laughs> so directed networks go in one direction or the other. Um, I am the mother of my child. Our relationship is directed. She cannot be my mother. Um, they're, they're, they can also be weighted. So if I really, really, really love Claudia, um, then our relationship has a 10. If I only kind of like Mar Marcelo, our relationship is like a 1. That's not true. I love everyone. So we don't need to weigh our relationship. <laughs> um, a path is what you call it when you're counting how to get from one node to another. Um, and that can be useful if you're trying to figure out like how an idea might have traveled using a path. A pivotal node kind of controls communication among different nodes. So you might be interested in figuring out um, who the pivotal node is between two players in a network because we're very curious about who wielded communicative power. You can break um, networks up into components, which is what I did with the Oscar Michaud network graph earlier, um, and look at them kind of um, as a smaller subset of a larger graph. And as um, we sort of hinted, you can use different measures of what's called centrality to figure out how important a particular node is. So centrality is a really important concept in network analysis and also kind of confusing because if centrality is a, a proxy for importance, there are many different ways a node can be important. Um, for example, degree centrality just measures the wrong number of edges that intersect with a node. Um, for example, Evelyn Creer was in like 40 degrees, she has a degree centrality. Um, so this node has a degree centrality of 3, this one has a degree centrality of 2, that one has a degree centrality of 2. So degree centrality can tell you something, but it can't necessarily tell you everything. Like, I love joining clubs, I join clubs all day long, I love to join clubs, I join every club on campus, so I have really high degree centrality. But am I really the person you want to talk to if you want um, a message relayed to every club on campus. Maybe not, because even though I have a lot of connections to a lot of different clubs, I'm not necessarily someone anyone cares about. Maybe I just like joining clubs. 
Um, so degree centrality is one kind of centrality, but not the only kind of centrality. And so in this mandatory role play, um, <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit more about different measures of importance within the network graph. So I need like maybe like seven volunteers. I expect my students to volunteer. <laughs> yeah. Volunteer. Yeah. Okay, great. Now we go. 
he belongs, I believe cluster means he belongs to cluster zero. So they, they've kind of separated the characters into different groups here. So now you know what those measures mean and, and why they might be important in different circumstances. Questions? Answers? <laughs> <laughs> Cluster zero, it's not a it's not a um, continuous value, it's like a like a discrete, it's a discrete value. Bias. Yeah. That's that's what I think anyway. I was looking at the about pages and I don't think that this is We're not even like class but like an ID. Oh, yeah, I so see. jewels is in cluster two and yeah, so they've actually used um, a clustering algorithm to divide the nodes into different groups, and that's what the colors reflect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Excellent. So let's get to the, the kind of software you might use for stuff like this yourself. So like I said, like understanding the, the concepts behind network analysis, like what is a node, what is an epi, what is centrality, what is degree centrality, what is a graph, um, that's actually the harder part, I think. Um, it's kind of like if you wanted to learn web design, by learning Dreamweaver, you know, it would be really hard without knowing like how the internet is built. So now you know how networks are built, you can turn to the software with a lot of a lot more confidence. Um, so what do people use? Just to break it down. Palladio is um, a web-based software package. It's designed specifically for humanists, and it's pretty easy to use. You can just drop some data in it. And it'll produce a network graph for you with only a few clicks. Um, and when I say it's designed for humanists, I mean that it's designed with the expectation that we're not going to be measuring values like centrality or um, density the way that some of the more advanced packages will. The expectation is that we'll use that network diagram to investigate connections. Um, which I think is actually a smart move on um, the software developers' part. They understood that humans tend to use networks in a slightly different way from scientists. Um, Stanford is, um, is has actually developed Claudio, so Claudio comes out of Stanford, um, and it's it's a really good tool. I've written a um, tutorial for it that's linked on the the Google Doc here. Google Fusion Tables is another good option. One limitation of Palladio is that you can't embed an interactive visualization on a website. Mm -hmm. But Google Fusion Tables does allow you to do that. Um, it has some limitations as well. It, I think you're limited to like 200 nodes. Um, and you can't control <coughs> parameters the way you can with more sophisticated packages. Um, you're kind of stuck with the colors they give you. And you can't run um, complex queries on it. Um, you can't really measure density or, or anything like that. But you can take some basic data, plug it in real quick, and get a network diagram that you can paste on your WordPress blog, for example. So that's a really fun one. Node Excel is really good if what you're interested in is social media, and specifically like Twitter hashtags. It's actually an extension for Excel, so it's not a standalone piece of software. You need to be using a PC. That's a barrier on college campuses. Um, but once you've got it running on your PC, it's a very quick setup. Um, and it'll allow you to compare many different social networks at once. Its documentation is really good. The team is really responsive, if you have questions. So getting into the, the packages that network scientists won't use more, more frequently, Gephi. Um, is designed for people who are dealing with large networks, has a, has a large universe of plugins you can use, um, including like a geolocation plugin, so you can show where people are located on a map, or um, different measures. If the, if the measure of a network you want isn't, isn't come built in on Gephi, <coughs> there's almost certainly a plugin for it. The limitation with Gephi, I find, is that it's not super stable, especially on Macs. Um, I find that it crashes more often than I would like. And um, 
Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Gephi's good. A lot of people use Gephi. I tend to prefer Cytoscape these days, which is uh, very similar to Gephi. Both of these, I should say, are free and cross-platform. Um, Cytoscape also has a large universe of plugins. I find that it's a little bit more stable than Gephi and that the user interface is a little less clunky. Um, and I've written a very <laughs> a ridiculously expensive tutorial for Cytoscape, which is again available on this website. Um, so those of you who are more comfortable with programming, um, a lot of people who do network analysis use the, the language R with the iGraph package. Um, if you're more comfortable on Python, the Network X package is really popular. And then D3, the JavaScript library, can't really analyze a network for you, but if you want to put it on the web, um, D3 is a pretty pretty common um, software package for, um, for web-based visualization. So I think that might be all I have, unless I'm mistaken. No, it is. Um, so I'm happy to take the questions. And Whatever I can tell you that that would be helpful. Yeah. So, so there must be a standard format for um, storing and, and exporting um, network data into D3, for example. Oh. How, how does it, it's not a CSV because it's, uh, it's a different, different, different things like different. Um, For what you see as really awesome network projects. Mm. Like, like I feel like there's a certain level of here's a node that's connected to some other things and there's a few things in between that are sort of standard, but I'm curious, do you have a few examples of what you would see as sort of pushing that form? That's a good question. I think it, it depends on what is awesome to you. Um, so like hardcore network analysts would point to like projects that have shown that you know, the strength of weak ties, for example, that you can get a message across to more people much faster if you have, like, a, if, if, you, if, you, if you are weakly connected to many people. Um, but in terms of digital humanities projects, um, I think people are still deciding what they think makes a good network analysis project for digital humanities, but there are a few that are worth looking at. Um, Six Degrees of Francis Bacon is, um, <laughs> Actually, um, a pretty advanced project. <laughs> Despite the name, <laughs> yeah. Um, and so this this sort of takes um, everyone in in Bacon world and connects them all together. Um, and so by clicking on an individual node, you you not only can see how a person is connected, but um, but but it's, it's kind of a tool in for exploration. I like that model of networks. I like that like exploratory model. I find I'm a little bit more comfortable with it than I am with like super quantitative measures of networks. Another one I like is inventing abstraction at, at MoMA. It's a, it's a project that, that MoMA did to show like how, um, how abstract artists were connected. And I find that the, the interface of this is really nice, and it actually does suggest some connections that um, might not have been apparent. Um, there are plenty of DH projects that do use quantitative measures of networks. Um, Andrew Goldstone at Rutgers does a lot of that. Um, and um, you might look at Franco Moretti's models of, of Hamlet as well and see what you think, see if you're convinced or not. 
if I could add to that, um, I just wanted to point to the Berkeley Postography Project, which is getting ready to launch. Um, and Adam, who just left, is actually going to be speaking, spoke at the Summer Institute and will be speaking soon about the old Assyrian Social Network Project and I would love for you to um, hear more about. But that's something else to watch out for. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, so it's great to know that you have some local talent on campus, and of course you do, so, so that's great. Um, oh, Matthew Lincoln has also been really deeply involved in um, like high-level network analysis projects for art history. So if you're interested in looking at someone's work on network analysis that is quite quantitative um, and, and sort of statistically rigorous, you should take a look at Matt's. And sorry, one last thing is just to plug uh, that if you go to the dlab.berkeley.edu consultant site, um, you can actually get a free consultation with um, Adam or other folks that are working on our analysis, but specifically Adam is going to provide these analysis stuff. That's so nice. Yeah. That's such a great opportunity. Yeah. Mm. Really What do you think the future is going to be? Like, do you see any trends or tendencies for the way that this is going to be used in years to come? Oh, network analysis? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I think it depends on what you're talking about network analysis, you know, as, in the DH as a discipline, yeah, or network analysis for DH. And I think they're two separate things, and that, that, that um, realization is becoming, I think, more clear. That the, the measures that are convincing to network scientists are not necessarily the same ones that are interesting or convincing to humanists. Mm -hmm. And so I tend to look to the kind of work that Palladio is doing. Um, I think that they're doing really interesting work on network analysis. Um, and exploration that really emphasizes the, the humanistic values of exploration and um, experimentation and changing parameters much more than those statistical measures. I mean, they, they think about these things all the way down to the way, you know, the tension in, in an edge when you move a node and, and the way in which that should feel like it should have some weight to it. Um, so I think the stuff that Stanford is doing on, on networks for the humanities is really interesting. Show you your um, graph of the um, library. Oh, I'm sure, I'd be happy to. So, this is a project that um, I've been working on lately. I have a collaborator at UCLA, his name is Michelle O'Reilly, she's in gender studies. Um, and um, she, uh, she's, she's um, of Maori heritage and um, We've been working together on um, a project that involves the, what's called the Maori subject headings. So you probably are familiar with the Library of Congress subject headings. Um, and we use them here in the United States to classify objects. And it, it turns out they use them in most parts of the world to classify objects, including New Zealand. Um, but Maori people in New Zealand found that what made sense for Library of Congress subject headings didn't necessarily make, se make sense for Maori cultural heritage objects. That that they they felt that these were um, that the the subject headings um, that Library of Congress propagated um, couldn't adequately express where Maori objects uh, lay in, in knowledge structure. Just to give an example. Um, <laughs> So the Maori subject headings um, were came from a group of Maori people who were also information professionals who wanted to like use use classification systems that made sense for their kind of knowledge. So the example that I love is that a spacecraft under the Library of Congress subject headings, a subcategory of rocketry, which is a subcategory of aeronautics, which is a subcategory of communication. Um, but in um, 
in the Maori subject headings, um, spacecraft is a subcategory of canoe because um, because the Maori have a long heritage of, of navigation and seafaring, and so um, canoes just have a pivotal place in their knowledge systems. Um, so much so that the that spacecraft are really kind of canoes for the stars. They're um, they're walking um, outer space canoes. Um, so working with Michelle and with the Maori subject headings group, I've been doing just some some projects to visualize the Maori subject headings. Um, so this is just an example um, that I most recently showed to the Maori subject headings group, um, and it's 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 a pretty standard actually D three visualization that allows you to search and then just to see how how one category gives rise to a bunch of children categories. Um, so it is a network and um, yeah we've been talking a lot about like ways one thing about networks, I don't want to belabor this so I didn't keep you too long in a hot room, but one thing about um, standard Eurocentric models of, of displaying networks is that they're designed to show you everything at once. Like that's the whole point of a layout algorithm is to increase legibility across the canvas. Um, but mountain knowledge doesn't necessarily work that way. Like you're not supposed to see everything all at once. Um, it's, it, it's much more like you, you have a little bit of knowledge and you talk to the next person and when that person thinks that you're ready to receive that knowledge, she'll, she'll pass it on to you. Um, Whereas kind of in the Western imperial system, like you stand on one planet and you look at all of the other planets. Um, and if you think about it, all the conventions of network analysis are designed to give you that impression that you have, like a global view. Um, and so, um, so the Maori subject headings group, when I showed them this visualization, they liked certain things about it. Like they liked that it was kind of bouncy, and they liked the colors, and they liked the like kind of mandala shape of it. Um, and they really liked seeing their work kind of arrayed for them, but they also really wanted that sense of like, in, you know, tra traversing from one piece of knowledge to another. Um, and they really wanted sound too, which surprised me. So I have to think now about like, how can we incorporate sound? And they wanted different colors. Um, so I guess all of this is just to say that network science is a thing and people do a lot of it and it is important and fun to know but the conventions of that discipline are only kind of one possible set of conventions within the universe the possibility so that's what i've been working on lately just those just the kind of design feedback you got from the group makes me think of that network analysis is um a new mode of representation is going to become more and more important to read as representation, totally. and that um, people wanting different features of representation in a network that represents their group, you know, is sort of the way that we think of like visual analysis of film as sort of like we'll look at how many actors of color there are, how many women, but like in a network analysis, we'll look at different traits like how many colors and how, and is there sound, or, right. you know, just right. different sorts of, we'll just be looking for a more abstract set, I think, of like how people, how people in groups are represented, so. Totally, and I mean, one kind of weird thing about categorizing anything, I guess, is that you can always find what you're looking for, and so, um, so it really impresses the importance of like, being so thoughtful about the categories. of really pushing boundaries in regards to intersectional analysis and cluster analysis. And I don't know if you can maybe talk a little bit about that work and then you get to the next one. Yeah, you know, I, I think so. I think DH is a thing and it's developed. And, and we've, we've gotten really good at certain things like mapping and um, network analysis. And so now I think it might be a good time to think about um, not just how we can use tools that we've borrowed from other disciplines to, to, to kind of create and suggest possibilities in the humanities, 
but also thinking about tools that are more appropriate to some of the things that we really care about, like critical race theory or queer studies or fan cultures. You know, so we were really thoughtful about the data structures that we use because we understand now that we've had some experience with them that they have a way of refining themselves, um, specifically, you know, and especially in, in visualizations. I find that I didn't really understand that completely until I did some of it myself. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, that's the value of it. Just along those lines, um, the minority project reminds me of a project that German scholar Lars Eckstein is doing, and I, I'm sure a few other people trying to read. Um, it's like difficult to say in words. Like the map, there were Polynesian navigators that helped Captain Cook navigate the oceans, and they had done it, and they passed down the navigation routes through song. And um, there was a, nav a Polynesian navigator that worked with Captain Cook and his team to try to draw a map based on the songs. Oh, and wow. that map survives, I suppose, or some version of it. And, that, and so people have been trying to read that map, because it's unusual. And um, one thing that, uh, and working with Polynesian navigators today, one thing the team said is um, the logic is very different. The, I, the islands, the land bases, um, you have to cast a line to and then pull your boat yeah, so cool. towards it. You have to fish for the land, and you are the moving point. The, you know, like the sea is where it is, and that, you know, and you move through the map. Like, you're not moving on the map or something. Mm -hmm. And so um, just trying to think about representation and abstraction and logics mm -hmm. and culture, you know, and ways of knowing that are, like the ways knowledges are passed down and things. I just think there's so much to, there's so many networks that could be represented differently or mm -hmm. otherwise or, you know, like whole other logics. Like it's, I think this is really fascinating. I think the moment we're at is really fascinating. Like levels of abstraction and representation as new media, we've had those moments before. So that was like a big part of age of expansion and you know colonization. So like, what does it mean now? And I, I think there's all kinds of issues with it that are so provocative and fascinating and kind of reminiscent of those, like earlier times. Too. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean that is so so fascinating to me. It's like well, why just stick with Cartesian space? If right. You know, right. Yeah. Other yeah exactly. Of space that make more sense to mm -hmm. people. And that really reflects people's experience in the world. Yeah. So, so yeah, yeah that was a cool opportunity to just think about, like, oh, well, there's, there's maps as we know them, and then there are maps as other people know them, and maybe we can think about that. And I do think when humanists and artists generate their own tools, the tools themselves will be built differently mm -hmm. than, you know, but this is a good, I mean, obviously, my class and other classes and other resources on the campus, you know, other campuses are, like, this is that moment when we're trying to train people to have enough of both skill sets to do that kind of work. Yeah, and I love doing it at the UC, too, because, like, um, because the students here are just, like, well, first of all, they're awesome and super smart, and they come from everywhere, and, um, and I find that, it, that my students just take for granted that we will, you know, adopt the things that they care about, like, race and gender and ethnicity, like they, they take it for granted that that should be included in what we do. And it's a really good like clarion call for us to, to be more rigorous about that. Yeah. Okay, well thank you so much everybody for coming. There are the full schedule of history and theory of the media lecture series is on that table outside as well as our technology and culture lecture so please pick up some posters on your way out, and you can also find the schedule online at bcnm.berkeley.edu. So please come to future events. We've got lots of great lectures this year. Thanks.